We've got a, a short series, short preaching series called Framework of the Christian Life. Progressive Christian growth is the work of God. You know, some call it sanctification. It's a word of scripture, but it means changing us into the image of Christ faithfully day after day after day after day. This is something that our Lord is committed to, and he's committed to doing it in your life. He's not just going to leave you alone. He he doesn't just hand you a ticket uh, to heaven uh, the day that he saves you and then just say, okay, I'll come and get you, and when you see me, you're going to be like, no, no, no. He, He is committed, just like a parent, a good parent, would be committed to growing a child Our Lord is, our Father, is committed to growing us day by day, progressive Christian growth. However, he does this in certain ways. I mean, what it looks like, the real growth looks like the fruit of the Spirit developing in our life. You know, love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Look, we're responding like Christ, for instance, becoming like Christ. We are both publicly and privately living holy, true holiness, righteousness. That's what the life looks like, the progressive Christian growth. But the Lord does this in certain frameworks. And I don't want to be weird here. I started this last week, but uh, let me explain it this way. You know, that happens, that real Christian growth happens in certain molds in the scripture. The Lord gave us skeletons, for instance, and, and, and certain forms, like you pour concrete out. In order for that growth to happen, these are, these are forms or frameworks on which our Christian life is grown and built. They're not necessarily the life, they are the frameworks of the life of make that, that make that happen. Last week we began talking about the plan of Jesus for the framework of the local church to be a vital part of your Christian growth. It's not something that you pick and choose. It's something that you need. And uh, we talked about that symbiont relationship and how we are dependent upon each other and how, how my spiritual growth is dependent upon you and your spiritual growth is dependent on me, not just as your pastor. But, uh, but as a fellow brother and sister called out of the world, saved by grace, and, and worshiping here locally together and interacting together. And before we turn our passage, I just want to say this. We have, we have several uh, visitors, many visitors here today, and some that are just very special friends and, and connections, and we are so glad that you're here. I hope most of all you'll see Jesus Christ as you've already seen him in the music and that you would see him through what we're about to talk about. Turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, the same passage of Scripture that we were at uh, last week. Ephesians chapter 4, we continue this message, uh, the community of the local church in your life. The community of the local church in your life, part 2. Ephesians chapter 4. Sounds like most of you have gotten it. Let's stand as we show respect to read the very words of God. Thus saith the Lord. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you. I beg you, Ephesians 4.1. I beg you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. That is, that is the salvation vocation or the calling of salvation wherewith you are called. Walk worthy of it. Make your practice match your position is what one is saying, verse 2, with all how? With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Look here, all those ones. I want you to understand that the application, you know, that we have been applying, of course, is the local assembly of believers here, the local church. But these ones, this is not an exclusive Lighthouse Baptist Church thing. We understand that? These ones apply to every man and woman in every place, in every time of history, who have named the name Jesus Christ, called on him for salvation. This is not a corner exclusive thing. I I hope you understand that 1842 Ots Chapel Road, that's our address for the visitors, 1842 Ots Chapel Road is not the only place or the exclusive place that the ones happen. In fact, how joyful it is to be going through Walmart or whatever, get to talking to a stranger or whatever, and find that they're a dear brother or sister of Christ. You know, the ones, okay? Let's keep going. But every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Now, here's a new thing he's talking about. Wherefore he saith, when he ascendeth up on high, he, Jesus, led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now he that ascended, what is it but that he also descended first in the lower parts of the earth? 
And let me just talk about eight and nine a second before we begin preaching. You know, I don't want this to be confusing. It's talking about the ascension of Christ. When he went back up to heaven after the resurrection, he gave the church, he gave people, individual believers who would call on him, spiritual gifts, okay? When it, there's, a, there's an argument about what it means when he, he descended. Probably it just means when he came from heaven. He went back to heaven. When he came down to here on earth, the lowest part of earth, Okay, some would argue that that meant that he went to hell after, the, after the, the cross. We'll not get into that. You can ask our assistant pastors who are, who are about to defend their position and their ordination what they think of that. But that's not the heart of what we're talking about, but that just gives you an idea there. Verse 10, he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things or fulfill all things. And he gave, what are these gifts? He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till, all, till we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of, of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we be... Henceforth, no more ch children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind and doctrine by the sleight of man and cunning craftiness, whereby they, they lay in wait to deceive. But, so we won't be that, but we will be speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him, into Jesus in all things, which is the head, even Christ from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body, unto the edifying of itself in love. You may be seated. Last week I asked you, where does, where does these 16 verses take place? Location. You know, where do we see this? Where do we see, you know, people that have trusted Christ and all the ones that are here? Where, where does this happen? The location of what it's being talked about. We concluded that verse number one, walking worthy here, and then, it, and then it going into, you know, the way we treat each other and lowliness, verse two, and meekness, and then into the ones that we have in common and all of this, and then the gifts or whatever. We, we concluded that, that our journey of our Christian life is not an individual journey. It's not, we're not, you're not an island in, you know, your salvation and your Christian growth. And that's, that's not at all the framework of how the Lord intended to save you and to grow you as a Christian. You're not an island. You're not alone in this thing, but you're part of one body. You there in this framework having gifted shepherds that you need to help you. Many members, many around you working together, interacting with you. In the verses in the text, you're not an island of your own in Christian growth. Believers are connected together under Christ in the local church. This is the location that, that Ephesians 4 plays out in. You know, I say this because there's a lot of books in the Christian bookstore, a, lot of, a church specifically in our area, that talks about your journey. This, as, as if it, this is kind of something that you're doing alone. And it's not supposed to be that way. Other believers are crucial to your Christian growth. They are part of how Jesus intended for you to grow. They are not optional. Your interaction with other people is not op optional. Other believers is not optional. It's not something that could help you. It's something that is necessary for you to grow and to walk worthy. Now, I'd like to look a little bit more closely here at the parts of this framework of the local church for us. And this will not be exhaustive about how the Lord uses the local assembly in your life. It's not intended to be that. But it's, uh, it's intended to bring out three things, three parts of the framework seen here in this passage and played out in other passages of New Testament scripture. As you well know, I, I don't normally preach topically. This is a topical series. i much rather take a book of the Bible and go the whole way through it. These are some things that need to be addressed and to build you and to build me. Number one, you see here in the passage, we looked at a lot of things last week. Number one, Christian fellowship is necessary for your Christian growth. Christian fellowship is necessary for your Christian growth. I want you to notice in verse number two, it says, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, see the word one another, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit, see the word unity, in the bond of peace. Keep reading here, for there is one body, one spirit, even as ye are called in, in hope of your calling. 
Notice verse number five, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. You see all this stuff here, the reason we're told about this one body and one hope and one Lord and one faith and one baptism, etc., one Father, is verse two and three for the purpose of knowing that we are not alone, but we have all these things in common with other believers and we're connected to them. And this unity or this one another thing is extremely valuable in our Christian life. We are told of the powerful one things that we have in common in order to draw us together like magnets into one, into unity, to bring us together, not to be drifting apart, but the one things that we have in common. When we really consider what we have in common because of Christ, folks, the small differences of personality or economic status or color of skin or gender or whatever all melts away. When you consider the oneness from verse four and six, look at it, that you who name the name of Christ, who are trusting Jesus Christ as Savior, have in this building, you understand that that is a magnet. The commonness, the oneness, pulls us together, what we have in common. And that's how it is in all relationships. You know, the common ground is what pulls you together. What is fellowship? When, when we say fellowship, you know, what is that? Well, it's a word that appears the whole way through the New Testament in different forms. And we, we see it in the forms like fellowship, that word. We see communion. It's the same Greek word. It's, it's talking about something that's happening in the local church or should happen. I've heard someone define fellowship. Some of you have too. Two fellows in the same ship. Okay, now that's good. That's actually, actually very, very good because they have the commonness of the ship together. Biblical fellowship means something that you have in common. That's the heart of the word fellowship. That's the heart of that word. And communion, same thing, communion, communion. It's what we have in fellowship. I'm not talking about the elements, the bread, and the juice. I'm talking about the communion that we have here together. We are in a communion because of the common thing. And of course, the common thing is the one, capital O. The common thing is the one who we love that we have not seen, the one who loved us so much that he took our sins upon himself and died on the cross for us. The one who can offer us a way to be born again into a new family, the family of God. The thing we have in common is Christ. And he is the great thing that changes of how I interact and how you interact with me, how I interact with you. And as we take hands and we join together, as we hug together, as we talk together, when we have Christ in common, everything else seems to melt away. All those things, whether you're talk to a guy somewhere, he's much, much taller than me. I'm extremely jealous of that. It's, you know, it's not fair. I should be tall so I could beat up people. But the Lord knew. He couldn't make me big. But that has nothing to do when his hand goes into my hand and we have Christ in common. That has nothing, that has no bearing. Economic status, color of skin, gender. We are one in Christ. We have this great person in common. We are blood brothers through the cross. We have received the same mercy and the same grace. We have received the same love. We share the same Abba Father. The same spirit indwells us. And he's trying to pull us together like a magnet. This is fellowship. And it happens at this local church. And it is necessary for it to happen in your, your life. You need this part of the framework of growing. It's not optional for you. It's ex extremely important as you read through this text and you read through so many other texts. Salvation in Christ makes us fellows in the same ship. I want to read a, a verse out of 1 John 1 that kind of emphasizes this. Listen for the word fellowship. It says, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. This is the author telling you about Jesus. That ye, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And folks, here is the bond. Here is what draws us together. Because we were drawn to Christ, we have fellowship with each other. All right, I'm saying that just like as preliminary, just to say this. Do you have fellowship with Christ so that you would have fellowship with other believers? And I say that by saying, not this general thing, I believe in God and I believe in Jesus. You know, have you come to understand what the cross was about? That Jesus Christ wasn't just dying for the whole world, he was dying for your individual sin. Have you come to the place where you believe like the scriptures, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God? As it is written, there is none righteous. Have you seen yourself as the sinner 
that eventually will face God and be judged by death, which means physical death and spiritual death, that you will be forever separated from God. And in seeing that, do you realize that God in love provided a way that you would not have to have that damnation and that he damned his son on the cross. And Jesus being damned on the cross is so you won't have to be damned. It's a substitute principle, not a principle, it's a substitute salvation truth that he died in your place. He hath made, the Bible says, he, the Father, hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So that is where righteousness comes from, not from sitting in this church. You can sit in this church every day and not be one lick more righteous. It doesn't work that way. You can try your hardest to keep all God's commands and all God's law, and you can't get one bit more righteous. Because, you know, right, that kind of righteousness doesn't wash away our sin. It doesn't make us righteous. There's only one way to be righteous, and that's the substitute. You've got to have Jesus' righteousness. You've got to give up and abandon your hope of goodness. And when you do that and you say, Jesus Christ, I am trusting what you did there on the cross and that you died and that you rose again for me and that is my only hope, solo Christo, in Christ alone my hope is found. When you come to that place, he saves you and you have fellowship with him. And when you have fellowship with him, you have fellowship with all the others that are trusting on him. And what a sweet and glorious fellowship that is. And it's part of your Christian growth. Now, I want to start off in this first point by saying, do you have fellowship with Jesus Christ because you have trusted him as your only hope and only savior? And if you haven't, why don't you come talk to me at the end of the service? We can settle that. You can call on Christ to save you and know that all your life's sin is under his blood, under his cross, and that you will never be damned because you're as righteous as he is righteous because he gave you his righteousness. So that is the starting place then of why we have fellowship because we have fellowship with Christ and we have fellowship with each other. Fellowship is practically living out the closeness and the commonness of what we already have in the gospel. We will all live together in heaven forever. The gospel, we are blood brothers. We are born again into the same family. So on this earth, day by day, as we interact with each other, that fellowship is just a playing out of the gospel. It is just working out what already has happened to us spiritually. We have been bonded together. It's not a choice. If you receive Christ, you've been bonded with me together because I've received Christ. It's an outworking of the gospel, of what Jesus did. Consider, folks, then this incredible importance of practically connecting with each other believers around you. Consider that it's not optional how important it is. Consider how important it was to the early church, the, the fellowship of the early church. Acts 2 and verse 42 says it this way. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and, yell out the next word, what is it? Fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayers and fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles and all that believed were together and had all things in common. Guess what that is? Fellowship. You know, that's the heart of the word. They had things in fellowship, in common, and sold their possessions and goods and part of them uh, to all men as every man had need, and they continuing daily with one accord. There's an, a, another word that's like fellowship. In the temple and breaking of bread and house to house to eat their meat with gladness and signalness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. In that early church, which is a great example, deacons, Sunday school adults, Sunday school teachers, always go back to the, these early church passages to get your idea of how things should be running around Lighthouse. In that early church, which serves as our example, it is so clear that fellowship or being together and learning together and sharing even physical substance together and eating together and praising together and having fun together and living life together is vitally important. Vitally important, not optional. We are birthed into a new family by the Holy Spirit called out of the world. And these are our brothers and sisters to laugh with and to cook out with and to hunt and fish with and ride motorcycles with, amen, and to have fun with and to cry with and to play with and to pray with and to learn with and to fellowship with. It is a joyful and glorious thing to have such fellowship and such 
a support group, and such Christian friendship, and such a bond in Christ. It is a wonderful thing. In fact, it is so great, I know that some of you, many of you, and I've said this before, I'm not, this is not self-promotion of Lighthouse, but you have said to me that your church family is closer than your physical family, okay? You feel that need, that support. You feel that you are growing together with the believers around you, and that's what Ephesians 4 looks like. Is that, what, is that what is going on in your life is my question. Have you built your friendships, Christians, and your time around the priority of being with other believers as much as you can? Is that, is that what the priority of your calendar looks like, your, your whatever, your day plan or your Trello, whatever the priority thing that you use? We are not talking about just church services. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about go to church. I'm not talking about that, just that. We are talking about living life together, fellowship around all the ones that we have in common in verse number four through six, fellowship around all these things that the Lord has done for us as a body, one body in in spirit and hope and the Lord and faith and baptism and God our Father. We do not hermit from the world, don't get me wrong. We do not stiff arm unbelievers concerning this. The world needs our Casual friendships as salt and light for the gospel, all right? We're not supposed to hermit and hide inside my house, Baptist church, and oh no, I might interact with an unsaved person. Oh no, one of my children might interact with this unsaved, unclean, unclean, unclean. No, that is not, you know, there's some hyper fundies that that's kind of, you know, the idea. No, that is not the case. They need salvation, they need evangelism, they need salt and light. But what we should be doing is actively cultivating that our closest friendships be believers. And I would take a step farther and say that, that uh, because the Lord has put us together here as a local church, that our close, many of our closest friendships would happen right here among this congregation. It is not coincidence that the Lord has brought you here. And it's not coincidence, as we're gonna find in our next point, that the people sitting on the other side of the room have something that you need to grow spiritually. I would ask, who, who are your closest friends and why? What is the common bond that you're allowing to bring you and others together? Maybe it's school or, or maybe it's some business economic thing or sports or, or work or career or even earthly family. That cannot match the bond, the in common that you have with other believers because of Christ. You have to understand the priority of that bond and the wonderfulness of that bond. See, these folks around you, the people sitting behind you whose names you can't remember, and I understand that. The, the lady who sits in the same chair, who is down the road for you, for you um, down the road from you. I was trying to, I'm stuck because Byard, right? Byard. I met Byard this morning. That's his first name, Byard. It's like Byard with a D. The people that we don't know, we need something from them. We can grow from them, the believers, these folks around you. You have the strongest things in the universe in common with them, even if you can't remember Bayard or their name, whatever. You need to be fellowshipping with them. You need to know them. As we look at Ephesians chapter 4, you see all the things that we have common and fellowshipping with others is vital to our Christian growth. I would just say one more thing about the need of fellowship with the Christian family. It is a foretaste of heaven. You know, that's really theatrical in some ways, you know. Just like heaven in this place. Yeah, except for the lady that cussed me in the bathroom or whatever, you know. Just like heaven, you know. Some of that can be a little, you know, corny, whatever. But the truth of the matter is, this local assembly is a foretaste of heaven. What do I mean? Revelation 7, 9 says it this way. Imagine the scene, after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude. There we are. With no, which no man could number, all nations, kindreds, people, tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and under the Lamb. Revelation 19 says the same kind of scene, and I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude. There we are. 
and the voice of many waters, and as the voice of many thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife, that's us, hath made herself ready. Okay, what is going on here in this local assembly when we come together and we laugh together and love together or whatever, as we spend time with each other outside and are joined together around the common things of Christ, it is a foretaste of heaven. One of the glories of Jesus and the hopes before us is that there's going to be a great multitude called the bride of Christ that will be together worshiping and fellowshipping at the marriage supper of the Lamb. It will be glory time together. And this view of these multitudes all being together around the land is, is heaven, it's eternity, it's the joyful thing. Now how does that work if we don't want to be together down here on this earth? I, I'm just saying that if it's not working that way, we need to change. We need to see the joy of that, the importance of that, the glory of that. I mean, I know that seems a little theatrical, but a church family that purposely lives life together in love and unity is a foretaste of heaven. There are a lot of churches that, that don't have that kind of health for different reasons. Some of it's wrong priorities, bad leadership and bad attitudes and, and selfishness and legalism and these kind of things. But I wanna tell you, Lighthouse, we need to strive to make it that kind of place that is a foretaste of heaven and the fellowship, the purpose, we realize we need each other. And this was God's design. This was not Toby's design. This is what the Lord wanted. This is how he fashioned and shaped us together in Ephesians 4 and so many other passages. The unity and love of fellowship certainly edifies and glorifies God. But I want you to see in our second point today that fellowship grows you for another reason. Okay, It glorifies God. It's a foretaste of heaven and all of that. You need it. It's just like the early church, all that that I said. Okay, But there's another thing involved of why it's so important for you to fellowship together. And point number two is this. Fellowship grows you spiritually because of the interaction of spiritual gifts to each other. I'm going to say that again. Fellowship grows you spiritually because of the interaction of spiritual gifts to each other. Look at verse number seven and eight, please. The Bible says, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Verse eight, wherefore he saith when he ascended up on high and he, he led captivity captive and gave, what's the next word? Yell it out. Gifts. He gave gifts to men. In this passage, it begins talking about gifts. We've talked about this a little bit last week. We remember that the immediate context here are the gifts that were gifts of and to spiritual shepherds in our life, pastors, evangelists, teachers, etc. But verse number seven has an interesting phrase in it. Every one of us. Okay? Is everyone in here an evangelist or a teacher or pastor? No. This phrasing is using, used in other places. 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12. This every one of us. It wasn't just that Jesus, this is talking about the gifts of pastoring and how that's a gift to you, you know, in, in the assembly. But in Romans, uh, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, the every one of us points out that every one of us have been given gifts, not just the preacher. Every one of us have been given gifts that are necessary to the spiritual growth of others. Verse 7 says every one of us is given grace according to the measure. What's that mean? Grace is another word for gifts. Measure how much the Lord gives, what he gives, whatever. It's not code words. It just means that alongside of your salvation, each one of us by the Holy Spirit have been given spiritual gifts to build each other's spiritual lives. This is fully developed in other passages. And I want to tell you, it's highly, highly neglected in Baptist churches. It's something that is obvious in Scripture, these spiritual gifts, but we don't really understand it very well, so we just ignore it. I want you to keep your place here in Ephesians 4. I want you to turn over to 1 Corinthians 12, please. Turn back to 1 Corinthians 12. I want to read you a passage. It is a bit long, so try to stay focused on what the Scripture is saying. But I want you to listen to this amazing teaching about every one of us, every Christian, having spiritual gifts. Now, I'm not talking about you're a good carpenter. I'm talking about spiritual gifts that were given for you to grow me and each other, all of us. So look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'll begin in verse number 4. Now, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, 
And there are diversities of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all, or to profit from. Look up here. It's saying that every woman, every man in this place has spiritual gifts so that we could all profit from them as we interact with each other. Keep on going, verse 8. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another a discernment of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and self same Spirit dividing to, what's the next two words? Yell it out. Every man, severally as he will. That means he gives several gifts, different gifts. Everyone has a gift, but he gives as he feels like the measure is right, the Holy Spirit in your life. Verse 12, for as the body is one, we've seen that before, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into that one spirit, that one Holy Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Well, that's crazy. And if the ear shall say, because I am not of the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where, would they, where were the hearing? If the whole... Uh, The whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased him. Or he's given them different spiritual gifts as it's pleased him. And if they were all one member, where where were the body? But now are they many members, but yet but one body. The eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of thee. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And it goes on, and the the reading goes on. I want you to see what this is talking about. You see here how we are connected and helping each other grow. Again, the illustration of the body. We are all, you know, this is a, a, a microcosm in this building of the body of Christ. We are all connected. We are all necessary. We all have gifts that each other needs. We're all connected. There are different spiritual gifts, at least one, as we saw, is given to everyone. To, he gives the measure. Every one of us has them by the Holy Spirit. The word of wisdom, knowledge, faith, or whatever. You see some miraculous gifts here that were prevalent in the apostles' times. Romans 12 even has more gifts. Talks about the gifts of ministering and teaching and exhortation and ruling and mercy. All gifts given in different measure to you, to each of us, by the Holy Spirit. Now this 1 Corinthians 12 passage makes it clear at the end that all the members of the body need each other for the gifts that each other has. Think about this a minute. You are necessary here to my Christian growth. I need you. You need the gifts that I have. We all need the gifts that each other have. There's no one that can say here at Lighthouse Baptist Church, I'm not necessary. It's not an individual journey thing. You're part of a symbiont body. We are dependent on each other. We need your gifts. I need your gifts. You need my gifts, each other's gifts. Our spiritual growth is connected and we need what each other has biblically. I believe we get the profit of those gifts and how that comes out through people taking part in ministries and what I've already said, fellowship. So I'm around each other, I'm ministering, I'm serving the Lord, I'm serving other people. And these gifts, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I may not even be able to identify how they're interacting in that person's life, but they are. This isn't a small thing in Scripture, it's a huge thing. This is a giant passage of Scripture, 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12. This is a giant thing. You have superpowers. And I need you to use them in my Christian life. And you need me and the people around you. You need to interact by ministry and by fellowship. We need each other to grow. It's not individual personal journey. It's our journey spiritually, sanctification. You need to have a ministry here at your local church where you serve Jesus and others so God will use your gifts. He will have ample use of them as you're willing to serve. I would encourage you to read 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans 12 and ask the Lord to reveal to you what your spiritual gifts are. 
I would really encourage you to talk to other godly, mature believers in your life and ask them what they think that yours might be. Often, you know, what you're good at and what seems to be a blessing to other people and frankly, what you like to do. You know, the Bible says, as far as a pastor's gifts, he that desires the office of a pastor desire, or a bishop desireth a good work. You know, one of the ways you can tell a man is called to the ministry if he wants to do it, if it's his desire. So that works a lot with spiritual gifts the same way too. Something that you feel drawn to, led to, want to do. You have spiritual gifts and the Lord wants to use them. Some of you have done something, some things and people have come up to you, other believers, and say, man, you're such a blessing to me and blah, 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 blah. Hello? That may be an indication of what your spiritual gifts are. When the Lord uses you when you're in a certain ministry position or doing a certain thing or whatever. You know, some people get just encompassed. They take tests and stuff about their spiritual gifts. I think you can go way too far on this, all right? It's not so much that you know exactly what your spiritual gift is, and until you do it, I'm not going to minister or I'm not going to fellowship with other people, whatever. It is that you're willing to be in positions of fellowship and positions of ministry so that the Lord can use you. He knows what your gifts are, and he'll take care of the use. You understand what I'm saying? You just be willing. And if you can ever put your finger, just be resolved to do good doctrine that you have spiritual gifts and I am willing to minister and I am willing to fellowship and I know God is using me because he said that I have these gifts and it's growing other people and I am necessary. Some of you are a foot and a nose, the Bible says. <laughs> you ever think it's kind of gross when you actually start thinking about what body part in that illustration is? I'm sorry, I've just offended some of you. No matter if you are a weaker part, if you don't have these great dynamic gifts of exhortation and ruling and administration or whatever, everyone is necessary. Everyone is necessary for the symbiont relationship of the body, for the dependency of each other. Let me just tell you something. If you come to church just to fulfill your duty, punch a card because you ought to go to church, you don't interact with anyone, you don't involve yourself in some ministry around here, you're not growing in the framework of what specifically Jesus and the Holy Spirit are trying to do with your life. This is not Toby stuff. This is the Lord stuff. This is real stuff. But it looks so much unlike the modern Christian church era that we're in. It's all about self. I want to say this also in shepherdly love. Some, some of you I have known for full length of time. You are here before I got here. So I've known you for about 12 years now. And some of you stay at your seat. You come in, you stay at your seat alone until the service starts. And then you beeline for the door when it ends. You don't fellowship with others. You don't attend fellowships when we have them to give you an opportunity to interact with other believers and your gifts and all of that. Maybe you aren't in a Sunday school class that actually allows more fellowship because it's smaller groups and you're interacting together. You don't, you don't talk to any believers outside of these services. You don't engage in any ministry opportunities within this church. And frankly, I, I say to you in shepherdly love, you are not growing the way that Jesus wants you to grow. That is not opinion. That is seeing the framework of the local church and gifts and fellowship in the scripture. This is how Christians grow. You know, you're not the lone ranger. You're not rogue. You don't have you know, godly permission that you're going to grow a different way as a Christian. This is the way of the New Testament. This is Jesus' way, the Holy Spirit way. If you will submit to God's word this morning, begin spending more time with your brothers, Christian brothers around you, and come see, come to one of the pastors and see what ministry that you can be involved with to serve the Lord and to use your gifts. So turn back, please, to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. Hopefully you kept your place there, Ephesians 4. We will see other things from this passage later on in our series, but I want to point out one more thing that goes along with fellowship and gifts, Ephesians chapter 4. Please read with me verse 16, that very detailed verse, Ephesians 4, 16. From whom the whole body, that's Christ, from whom? From Christ. The whole body fitly joined together. Okay, think, think about body parts being connected. This is the verse. And compacted by that which every joint supplieth. You know, there's all these 
these veins and blood and other stuff that run through the body. Don't want to gross anybody out, but that's what this is. Every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part. So every part is playing a job. Every part is necessary for a complete body there. Making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself and love. When that happens and every part is connected and every part is using its gifts and every part is dependent on each other, then the body grows spiritually, increase the body, just like a physical body, a human body grows. We're gonna see some other things here, but again, this in this verse, which is hard language when you read it through first, you take it slowly and this is what you get. We are the joints that are fit together and joined together, the body parts, supplying nourishment to each other. And somewhere down the line, it comes from the head Christ, where this, all the, all the communication, all the decisions of, you, of growing your Christian life, and we are connected to each other, and it flows through us from the nourishment that comes from Christ. And then you see the phrase here, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, or plainly working by which every part does its share. Imagine then a human body, you're part of that body. Picture the human body, the organism that's functioning together. Each part is doing its measure or its share. Certainly this preaches to us what I've already talked to you this morning, fellowship and everyone using your gifts, but it speaks of something else as well. Consider for a moment, and some of you, this is real kind of stuff because you have family members that this has happened, whatever. Consider for a moment if your kidneys decided to take a break and not be in your body for a few days or weeks. I, you know, I got something to do. Can't, sorry, not gonna have kidneys. Sorry, gotta go somewhere. Or perhaps your tongue just couldn't find the time to be connected to your mouth. Now that would be good for me, okay? <laughs> or maybe your knee just said, you know, I... I can only be available to work for you, my knee. I can only be, sorry, it's saying you know, down there, your knee. Consider Hebrews 10 and verse 23. And of course, that early church example is they were with each other daily. Some of you, drive, I would drive you crazy if you're with me daily. Okay, I understand that. God has given that grace to my wife, Amy. Consider Hebrews 10, verse 23, this famous passage about this. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. So this is, we're all on this journey. The, it's our faith, okay? We are, we are progressing in the Christian faith together without wavering. For he is faithful that promised, that's the Lord. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another And look at these words, these four words. So much the more. Not so much the less. So much the more we are to assemble together and to provoke each other to love and good works. As you see the day approaching, what day is this? The day of judgment or the return of Christ? Or or maybe it means your death, but it means as time rolls by, you need to strive to be around believers more, not less. So much the more. You need them. You need their provoking, a word that usually is negative. It's positive here. Provoking to good works, to love and good works. We need to provoke each other in a positive way. We need each other so much the more, not so much the less. As time rolls on, as the world gets darker, as Christ's return is imminent, we need to be together all the more. Encourage each other, holding fast the profession of our faith, stirring each other up to love and good works so much the more. We aren't supposed to look for more time to spend alone. We're not supposed to look for more time to get rest from our busy schedules and take a break, and I just need alone time. We're to make a a priority of our lives to assemble together and to be together all the more as we see the day approaching. So much the more. In modern Christianity, the idea of minimalist worship so that you can go to church for the smallest amount of time and, uh, you know, I understand that in some churches there's a big countdown uh, in our area that you get out exactly in an hour and you, you know, the message is 17 minutes or whatever and you know when you're in and you know when you're out. Bless God, let's do as least as we possibly can do as far as being together and worshiping and interacting in our fellowship and our gifts. That is crazyville. That is unbiblical. That is, that is ridiculous. That is not Christianity. 
And that is not the framework of how we're supposed to live life together, folks. We need each other. So here are some real-time change that needs to happen as you obey the word of God. We need you, literally, to be here to connect with us in fellowship and ministry like a body part when we assemble. We, we, we meet in Sunday schools specifically to have more close spiritual interaction with a smaller number of believers. You know, there's no way that how many of you are here, 280, 300 people, there's no way that you can interact that way. It's just like bees almost in here. You know, a closer fellowship that's what Sunday school is about as you learn in a smo- uh, closer group of interaction. We meet on Wednesday nights primarily to be refreshed spiritually in the middle of the week, to put our minds on the Lord for a little while, a shorter message, and to, to pray in small groups together. That is the purpose of Wednesday night, to encourage you through your week, to keep your eyes on the Lord, to pray about burdens of our heart, and, and we gather together. The men are over here, and, and they're in small groups, and the ladies are over here in small groups crying out, to the Lord, that's the purpose. Sunday nights, I feel, are the strongest times for really the core of Lighthouse. The heart of those who are assembled are really embedded, or they're, they're, they come on Sunday evenings to hear the word of God, and, and they mean real business for the Lord. That service, uh, more than any other service, has Christian application. I preach extreme, we're going through the book of Daniel, and uh, that, that those messages have been extremely close application for your Christian life, stuff that you can take away and do Monday morning from the word of God. After the service on Sunday nights provides lots of fellowship time. And you, can tell, you can talk to the guys who have to turn off the lights and lock up the building that people around Lighthouse like to stay forever. And that's very biblical, interacting and fellowshipping with each other. Some go out to restaurants together some, you know, afterglows, they have their own little afterglows, whatever, that's all wonderful. Sometimes we have fellowships on Sunday night after we're in the fellowship hall. And that's all very biblical. I'm asking you by the framework of how Jesus grows believers' lives in the word of God, in the New Testament, that you make it a priority. Above your busy schedule and other activities to be with the other believers in this room that you're connected with, so much the more every time we meet and assemble. Not for some legality reason, some performance for Jesus, I'm a better Christian, whatever, because we're a body and we need everybody and we need each other to grow. Please put away thoughts of sampling the church or coming when you can if it's nothing else that you have going on and see yourself as a vital organ, a member of this local body, and simply realize you can't grow effectively without us, and we cannot grow effectively spiritually without you constantly. Would you bow your heads as we consider the word of God?